The starting of the collecting was about 1985 or 86. Um, and I was walking down a road in London and I saw a very nice small walnut Madonna and child slightly bashed around in a window of a dealer's shop, Richard Phillips. And I went in and he gave me a cup of coffee and he let me hold it. That was the first time I'd ever been allowed to hold a piece of medieval art. And I went home with it. And as you say, one thing leads to another. And I've been doing it ever since. But the, the, the interesting question is perhaps, why did I get interested in such a thing? Um, and the answer to that is, 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 I have no knowledge of or interest in, in medieval art or any other art, really, until I married Jane, my wife. She'd been at the Courtfeld um, and um, studied there for her MA and was then working at the Courtfeld when I courted her and tore her away. And we went off to live in Germany, in Munich, in 1976. And my idea of a, um, of a good Saturday was to get up late go to the pub and maybe go and watch a movie. Her idea was to get up at 4 a.m., drive to Northern Italy and look at Romanesque churches. And being a good husband, I said, that's a good idea, we should do that. And I absolutely fell for the Romanesque. And living in Munich, we were surrounded by some of the most beautiful Rococo sculpture and churches, the Azam churches in the world, lots of Renaissance stuff in the Pinacotech and modern paintings too all the clays and marks and the various museums. And it just didn't move me the same way that Roman air sculpture did. And I've often wondered why. Um, you can't answer these things. Why do some people like wine and some people like whiskey? I like both, so it's all right. But, um, I think the answer was, first of all, the simplicity. I think that's what really got to me, that it's absolutely simple and from the heart and not too complicated. You move towards the Renaissance, everything gets more complicated, difficult. It's cleverer, it's more structured, but there's something really basic and heartwarming about the simplicity of Romanesque sculpture. And I think the second and only other reason was once I started collecting and, and reading about um, the medieval period, especially the uh, 11th and 12th century, I realised that the real Renaissance was the 12th century, not the 15th century. That was when there was the revolution in learning, the universities began, the revolutions in agriculture, revolutions in travel and transport, revolutions in everything. It was a phenomenal period and obviously a vast church building programme and artistic program, mainly around the churches, some secular stuff, witnesses wall. Um, and to me, the most extraordinary thing is these artists, almost entirely unnamed, weren't living in castles and stone buildings. They were living in huts or even tents outside the churches, producing these beautiful things. And I found that deeply impressive. Sam Fogg uh, sh showed me one of the most beautiful objects, I think, which ever, ever passed through, through, through his gallery, um, which I believe now is in, in the collection of, of uh, Nicholas Ferguson in Scotland, um, who had the, the wisdom and foresight to buy this marvellous object from, from Sam. And, and curiously enough, I mean, this is an anecdote which has the sort of interesting is an interesting reflection for, for, for the market in art, really. I mean, I'm not an expert on the market in art, but it, it's, it's a notable factor that um, with Romanesque sculpture, which isn't everybody's um, obvious collecting point, that figure sculpture seems to be what everybody wants. And that the foliage sculpture, which is often the most beautiful and interesting and varied 
um, aspect of Romanesque sculpture doesn't seem to attract the, the collectors. And that, that's just a, a passing thought. But uh, in this case, um, uh, I can only say that um, the design is, is just a wonder. And the underlying feature is a kind of interlace which, which is wrapped around the basket of the capital. And then at the foot of the capital are two affronted birds on each face, um, a sort of parrot family, I suppose, a parroquet sort of family with, with wings facing each other. And the, the form of the capital is a, is a, is a cubicle um, upper third and a chamfered lower third. It's to that challenge of that particular extraordinary um, form of the capital that the sculptor has responded and managed to, to create this, this perfectly beautiful and um, decorative ensemble. The, the capital, I think, uh, pretty certainly comes from the Ile Bar, uh, which is an island, the, the, the wild island in the Seine, um, just a few miles up the Seine from the city of Lyon in the Rhone Valley. The, the Ile Barbe was a very early uh, monastic uh, site. Uh, there are even, uh, even, even evidence of a fifth century monastic settlement there, and, and then a great uh, rebuilding in the Carolingian period, ninth century. And then uh, in the 11th century, the great abbey church of Saint-Martin and Saint-Lou on the island was rebuilt. And when it was destroyed, um, it, it, it first in the wars of religion and then in the 19th century, um, numerous capitals from the Ile Barbe were taken, distributed, um, bought, sold, and passed into private collections. Some came into the suburbs in Lyon in houses, Others were used, um, for instance, to redecorate new buildings. There's a, there's a baptistry, a new baptistry was built by an architect called Polle in, in the great abbey church of saint martin Dene in Lyon itself, with capitals reused from the Ile Barbe. So it was a sort of quarry for capital sculpture and so on. Um, and and um, in the 19th century, when lots of restoration was going on in, in, in Lyon. And um, I'm pretty sure that this one wonderful capital comes from, from the Ile Barb. Um, and a personal anecdote, in, in 1976, uh, when I was um, working in the archives in Lyon, I went out to the Ile Barb one day. To, I'd never been there before. And um, I took my little car out and trundled out to the Ile Barb and and crossed the bridge on foot and wandered about in the alleys of the Eel Bar. And a very nice lady came out of a door in a wall. Um, she was called Madame Cotinet. And she came out and she, and she saw me looking, looking at a tympanum in the wall, uh, which comes from the same church. And she uh, said, uh, you know, are you interested? I said, yes, I am, and so on and so on. It was in the summer. She said, well, why don't you come in? And I came into her property and there, at the end of her garden was the last surviving elevation of the great church of the Ilbar, with all the capitals still in place on that particular facade, which is the south transept facade of, 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 the, of the Abbey Church of, of the Ilbar, with capitals similar to, but none I think quite as beautiful as the one that, that uh, came through Sam's uh, hands. Thank you.